amazing series. Hello viewers and welcome to Amazing Series. I'm your host Ama and those who know me know that I am a serious bookworm and nothing thrills me more than a very good book. So we have a segment now on authors and budding authors and I found this fantastic book written by Nana Brew Hammond. She's here to talk to us about what inspired her to write this very juicy book. It's quite entertaining and also to tell us a bit about herself. I think you're going to enjoy Nana. Nana, thank you for joining us on Amazing Series. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us, first of all, what inspired you to write this book? Well, um, when I was 12 years old, my parents sent me from Queens, New York, which is where I grew up, yeah. to Ghana, yeah. which is where we're from. And it completely, completely changed my life. It changed my whole outlook on you know, what was normal, yeah. what I wanted to be. And I knew that you know, I had to put it down on paper at some point. So before, for those who haven't read the book, because I know after this you're going to pick it up, but before we even get to the details of the book, which I would want you to give us a, a snapshot of it, tell us really who, who is this author, who is the one behind Powder Necklace? Uh, I was born and raised in Queens, New York. I was very much a Queens girl. You know, my life consisted of, you know, the sort of radius of the blocks that I lived on. Um, but what was interesting was that when I got home, my, there was this whole other culture that was happening. You know, we ate different food. My parents spoke different language, you know, on the street, which was mortifying to me as a kid. So um, I always kind of lived that dual life. And as a kid, I just anyway, just wanted to fit in. I didn't want any differences. I didn't like the fact that my name was Nana while other people's names are Nicole or, <laughs> or whatever. So, um, so that was a lot of where I was, and then my parents made this decision to send us to Ghana. And in sending us to Ghana, it was the first time that, one, I realized that the world was so much bigger than where I had grown up. And also, I got a context. Now I understood why, okay, Nana is my name, and where that comes from, and, and all of that. And that, in the end, was amazing. And when you got to Ghana, what was the first culture shock? Even though my parents are from Ghana and you know they're they're educated and they're you know perfectly cultured people, but I had growing up in the States, I had such a negative view of Africa. I had what I was seeing on the news, which was the Ethiopian famine at the time. So I was shocked when I got into the car and see like there's tons of cars on the road, yeah. and not only tons of regular cars, but like luxury cars, yeah. and there are mansions and you know. I think what struck me most in Ghana was the dichotomy. It was, you know, you see a mansion and then you see a village right next door to the suburb of mansions. So I think that was what I kind of took away um, from the experience, just the dichotomy. I think it's, it's interesting you bring that up because a lot of the, the struggles and the discussions we have with ourselves is we usually feel that the mainstream media does not focus on both sides of Africa. They focus on the poverty-stricken part. and I surprised that someone who grew up in a Ghanaian setting, that she, the, the, what you see in the news is so powerful, you don't realize that even though your parents say, it's not like that, and you've seen the pictures, once you still land there, you're like, okay, it, it's really not that bad as it looks. So when you moved to Ghana, you went to school in, at Infantsamai, which mm -hmm. is an all-girls uh, school at, uh, in Cape Coast, it's along the coast of uh, Ghana. And how was that like? Miss America <laughs> goes to Infantsamai. <laughs> How was it like to be in a boarding school in Ghana? Um, it was that was another culture shock. <laughs> I mean, because again, I was twelve when I went. I was not used to being first away a fall away from my family. So that was really I, not only was I away from my parents in America, but I was away from my family in Ghana mm -hmm. at a boarding school. What would you say were some of the highlights of your experience? How long were you there for? I was there for three years. I went from Form 3 to Form 5. Um, the highlights were, I mean, one of the things my dad romanticized was the friendships are pretty unbreakable. And I will say that the friends that I had from that experience, I mean, I may not speak to them as often as I'd like to, but we're tight. We're sisters. You know, when you go through that kind of struggle, um, and then also, so when I went to Infantiman, I went there, lucky me, in the midst of a crazy water crisis, like no water. 
people were fighting, mm -hmm. struggling. It was crazy. Um, but it was kind of interesting because we learned, we, we really kind of became very resourceful. Um, I mean, I remember like, you know, the water, we used to fetch this water from a ground well that was like not clean water at all. And like, literally we're sitting there sieving it. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool that I know how to do this, you know, or um, just lots of little things so that you I learned, learned to how do. how to balance a bucket on top of your head. Have you done that before? I did not. I <laughs> never was very good at it. My, my good friend who was there was from Brooklyn. And this girl, I remember watching her. I was like, she's so majestic. I mean, she wore it like a crown. I was like, wow, you are my hero. Because I could never do it. I was like, I was a weakling. For those who are not familiar with what we're talking about, as Nana is saying, sometimes when there's water shortage, you have to go to a different place to fetch water. And you have to balance a bucket on your head. Of course, there's usually cloth or a cushion, and it also serves as a balancing effect. And you have to balance it well. But if you don't, imagine balancing this bucket of water on your head and you walk for miles. And just before you get home, you make one wrong turn and the water falls. <laughs> and then you have to go all the way back and fetch the water. Yeah. yeah, so it's not fun. No, it's not at all. I, I just carried it and I cried the whole way. <laughs> and how would you say the education was in, in Ghana? What kind of education? Because that's the key, aside from everything, the cultural aspect there's an academic education that your parents also wanted you to receive how would you compare both i definitely think the education was superior to what i was receiving in the states i mean it was first of all partly because there weren't that many facilities like you really had to know what was going on it wasn't like oh you pour something into a beaker and then it explodes and yay now you've learned no i mean we did some of that but a lot of it was literally just kind of studying I remember like us being up all night studying. Did you adjust well academically? I think did you I have did. an edge over the Ghanaians or were you no. no, no? I was what was crazy and that was another shock for me because I was one of the smartest girls in school here. Uh, in the States and then I went to Ghana and I was like I remember getting my first test back and I'm like, What? I mean I I my first term was like not fun and not pretty. But um, it was good because, again, like I said, I needed that because it kind of shocked me out of my sort of idea of how smart I was and how perfect I was. And I studied and I, you know, I learned. You know, I read the book, of course, this powder necklace. You can find it on Amazon.com. Yes. And when it came out and I, I just going through it, I know it's fictional, but it's inspired by your life. And you talk about your mom, you talk about your dad, a few tweaks here and there. But the people leave through this book and call you and say, Nana, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> how did your family respond to the book? My parents were so happy and proud of me. Um, I mean, I'd been telling them I want to be a writer, I want to be a writer. And, you know, and they were always like, get a real job, get a real job. So to see the book in hand, I mean, they were just so proud. Um, and you know, they, my mom had a funny thing to say. She said, you know, you see this Ghana that you were complaining about, look, you have a book out of it. <laughs> so, I mean, they were happy and they didn't, and I actually, what I really feared was that, you know, Infant Saman would feel like I misrepresented them or felt, feel like I didn't represent them. Did you them get well. any backlash from people from Infant Saman? Not Infantsman? at all. I actually was welcomed and supported and really, um, you know, um, encourage. Uh, one of the reasons why I am doing this segment on writers and artists is I've written a book and writing a book has given me newfound, I take my skirt off, I take my bra off, I take my hands, I take everything, I strip and bow at the feet of any of us. I, I love to read and when I read a book I'm always like, oh this, this, oh, this is a good one, this is a good one. But you haven't, until you write a book, you have no idea the, the sweat, the blood, the work that goes into it. So I, I just, I just, I, 
if it wasn't that this was a family show, I would just trip and just say, well done, well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. Well done. It's a good book. It's published by, I think, uh, Simon & Schuster. Simon & Schuster. And the second one, I can't wait for it to come Thank out. Thank you. Just because you, you just write very well. Thank you very much. And we're happy to have you on this show. Thank you so much. This is amazing. I'm so pleased to be here. So... When you're done, go on Amazon.com and take a copy of this. You're going to love it. Thank you for joining us, and I can't wait for you to meet our next writer. Take care.